Here. Ms. Flanagan? Here. Ms. Maddox? Here. Mr. Milner? Here. Dr. Stambaugh? Here. And Mr. Zayer? Here. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to make a motion to approve this morning's agenda. So moved.
And whereas the court's pronouncement in Brown v. Board of Education validated the struggle and remarkable actions of countless Americans who challenged the destructive effects of segregation in our society through peaceful and lawful means, and whereas the court's decision has had a profound, significant, and beneficial impact on all aspects of life in the United States, and whereas many areas of our nation are still struggling with how to remove the vestiges of segregation in education. Now, therefore, it needs to be resolved by the School Board of Henry County in historic recognition that May 17, 2014, marks the 60th anniversary of the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board of Education, and be it further resolved that this resolution is to further a nationwide appreciation for the advancement of democratic principles through our system of law and justice using the unanimous 1954 Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board of Education as a touchstone, and be it further resolved to inspire all of our nation's children, regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, disability, or economic status, to appreciate the value of public education and public service as a means to further the objectives of democracy, justice, and equality, and be it further resolved that the School Board of Henry County encourages direct student participation through essays, creative arts, lectures, research and writings, community projects, and other activities to foster personal commitment to democracy, and be it further resolved that the contributions of civil rights leaders and volunteers, parents, and students be recognized, for it is only through their courage, conviction, and sacrifice that Brown v. Board of Education became a reality, and be it further resolved that on the day of May 17th, our nation's schools are encouraged to mark the anniversary of Brown v. Board of Education with an appropriate ceremony and remembrance. Thank you, Mr. Hale. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve and adopt this resolution, R14-11. I'll move for approval and adoption of the resolution. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. This resolution is approved and adopted on this day by the Henry County School Board. Thank you, Mr. Hale. We'll move to the information agenda. The first item there, understanding by design. Mr. House is going to introduce our presenter. Glad to have with us this morning is Janet Lewis, who's a middle school corrections specialist. And as you know, we've been working for about a year and a half on revising our curriculum. And Ms. Lewis is going to share with you some information on understanding by design, which hopefully will make some things a little clearer for you and familiarize you with some of the vocabulary terms and things that you're going to be hearing over the next several years, because this is an ongoing process, because curriculum work is never done. Ms. Lewis. Thank you. Good morning. So just a quick overview today of the understanding by design that we're using as we revise and write curriculum for the county. So first of all, what is understanding by design, abbreviated as UBD? This is a framework for planning curriculum. It includes assessment. It includes instruction. And the nice thing is that it's not new. It was first developed by Grant Wiggins and Jay McTighe in 1998. It's been used across the country and around the world by many divisions, working with this as a way of organizing what their students learn and how they are taught. There are two big ideas in this framework. The first, the focus on teaching and assessing for understanding and learning transfer, and that the curriculum is designed backwards. And I'll explain both of those in more detail in just a minute. The nice thing about this and what really speaks to me is that all aspects are aligned. We make everything work together, what we want students to know, how we know that they know it, and then how we teach them, how we get them from what we want them to know to demonstrating that they actually know the material and the content. So understanding and learning transfer. That's a bit of teacher talk, and we don't want to have that. We want everything to be very clear for everyone. So when we look at these ideas, we want students to be able to do something with what they have learned. We don't want rote memorization. It's nice to know that 2 plus 2 equals 4, but what can we do with that piece of information? 
because we don't want students to go through school and then graduate and not know how to apply any of what they have learned. They've got to be able to use these things in other settings and other situations. We know that factual knowledge and skills are not taught for their own sake. Everything we are doing in school should be to get our students ready to go out and be productive members of society. Why do we call it backwards? So the units are not planned in the order that they will be delivered. And this is a revelation for me when I first came across this at a seminar of the University of Virginia several years ago. When I first started teaching, I decided what students, what students needed to know. I then designed the lesson to teach them that content. And then at the very end of the unit, I would design my assessment, be it a test, quiz, a project. That's not how UBB works. What you do is you determine what they need to know, the goals of the unit, which are aligned with our state standards. You then determine how you know they know it. So once I figured out what my students need to know, then I designed that assessment piece, be it a research paper, a project, or some kind of test. Only then do I figure out how to get them from point A to point B. So it's not planned chronologically. That's why we call it backward. So the logic is very clear to coaches and to teachers who work in the performing arts. When a coach begins to plan for a season, they plan everything with the game in mind. All practices, all activities are designed for the students to win the game. When a band director is preparing the students for a concert, Everything they do in class is designed to get them ready for the concert. And so it's very intuitive for them. The rest of us tend to think very linearly. We tend to plan in order. And so this is kind of the, the big epiphany with this framework. One of the ways that we assess students is called a performance task. And so a performance task requires evidence of the student's ability to apply their learning. And it's not just, I taught you 2 plus 2 equals 4 on the test, you're going to show me that 2 plus 2 equals 4. These performance tasks need to be new, varied, and realistic. So they will do something with the information. There needed is evidence of understanding. We've got to see if they can take these facts that we've taught them and apply them in new ways. Can they actually do what we have taught them? And we like them to be real world. We like them to be messy, and that's something that's a little nerve-wracking for some teachers. Some of us like to have, this is the right answer. But with these performance tasks, there are numerous options for right answers. There are a lot of different ways to show what students know. And they have varied audiences and varied purposes, creating that real-world context. One framework that Wiggins and McTighe developed for creating performance tasks is called the GRASP model. And we don't use this for all of them, we do use them for some. It kind of helps us keep these pieces in mind. So you have a goal. The students often are given a role, some kind of professional capacity. There's a very specific audience for what they are creating. There's a situation, a performance or product, and then standards by which these things are graded. So some examples, and these were created by teachers in Henry County, because they've been working in teams to help write this curriculum. This is one from secondary English. The Academy of American Poets is applying for a grant to create an interactive poetry app. You've been hired to create a demo using PowerPoint or other appropriate program for the grant proposal demonstration. Using a text of your choice, either professional or original, annotate the poem to include examples of rhythm, rhyme, internal rhyme, alliteration, assonance, consonants, and repetition, as well as their effect on the overall piece. You will present your demo to the grant committee. So in this performance task, we have embedded all of our grasps. So the goal of this is for a student to be able to annotate a poem and also explain the effect of these poetic techniques on the actual piece. Their role is someone who is going to create an interactive poetry app. The audience is a grant committee. The situation is this grant process. Their performance or product is obviously not a real app unless they have access to that technology to some kind of PowerPoint. And the standards would be the rubric that the teacher has created to assess this. Now, I personally would have a lot of fun doing a 
an assignment like this. It's much more interesting than a multiple choice or a matching. Find an example of assonance. Find an example of rhyme. It's much more real world. Another example, dropping down to kindergarten math. You're a travel agent who plans trips for people. A customer has called and wants a suggestion for her next vacation. She's interested in going to a city that has weather that is different from Henry County. For two weeks, use weather.com to track the weather for a city that has a different climate than where you live. Record the weather for that area using a tally table. Keep track of items such as number of sunny days, number of cloudy days, etc. Make a graph using the data you collected. Do you see any patterns in the city that you are studying? How does the weather compare to where you live? Be prepared to share this information with your customer. As with the secondary English, our pieces are embedded in the task. The goal is for students to be able to use a tally table and make a graph, finding patterns and comparing it to other data. But their role as a travel agent, their audience is their customer who wants to take a trip. And the situation is you've got to research and make a presentation to this customer. And again, graded by the standards, created by the teacher, all the facts are there. But wouldn't that be exciting for a kindergartner to, with help, perhaps go on weather.com, look at a place very different from Henry County. I think this would be fun to do in January when it's 30 degrees here, but beautiful in Phoenix or New Mexico, and say, wow, it's different there. Many of our students don't have a chance to travel a lot. This is one way to take them out of their classroom and have them interact with other places. Finally, I like this quotation from Lewis Carroll, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And so we're using this framework so we have a very clear direction for our students and our teachers. We don't want any mad hatters going nuts here at the end. So we have a very clear path for them to follow. Are there any questions? It's been used in schools across the country and around the world. They find it very successful. Many divisions use this framework. There are a lot of variations. We took Wiggins and McPie's initial framework and adapted it slightly for our needs here in Henry County. But there's marvelous anecdotal evidence as well as research-based evidence that this is a very effective way to plan. I used it, in fact, in my classroom for several years, and it was amazing to me the clarity that it brought to what I was doing. <coughs> that we're doing to help with that is all, all teachers receive stage one, all the goals, and a sample stage two. So they can use that to look at as an example. And they may use it if they wish. But if they have something that's better suited to their students, they can adapt it or use their own assessment. So while teaching the test sounds really bad, if you're teaching to a real world task, I don't see that as a negative piece. Or something that's worth teaching. We personally have not fully rolled this out in the classrooms, but these were written by kindergarten teachers, and they were all vetted by the kindergarten teachers and all the elementary teachers at their collaborations meetings in the fall, and the feedback was very positive. And one nice thing, since it's our curriculum, if we try it next year in a classroom, they can call us and say, this is too easy or this is too hard, and they can also modify it within their classes. That's one thing I like about this. No one's locked into these. I often would get ideas for lessons from the internet, but I never did them word for word because my classes were unique. And so I knew them, I knew my strengths as an instructor, and so I would tweak things to make them fit. So if a teacher gets this task and rolls it out and says, this isn't working, they can always regroup. So there's a lot of flexibility built into this.
seems like the uh, first example of when the classical language class has some elements of what the new text version was trying to do a month earlier. Yeah, Donna Hicks has worked very closely with this to incorporate the new tech elements. Any other questions? Yes, uh, at some point will we see some See actual performance tasks, and there, I don't see any reason why we couldn't. Yeah. Other questions or comments? This is an information item, so it's not a whole lot of vote. We appreciate your time, and uh, it's very interesting. I'm anxious to see some of the projects. We're very excited. Um, Liz Motley, Don Hicks, and I have worked closely with this, but we have lots of teachers as well that have contributed these, and it's been very exciting. Thank you for your time this morning. Yes, Dr. Bob and members of the school board. Simply, um, this is just for your information for you to review every year. We do have to present the code of conduct. You will have on your screen to, to review. The, the corrections are highlighted for you. If there's any comment that you would like to share with me, please do before I present it for the second reading at the June board meeting. Areas that I may direct you to, the major changes, if you, when you do go through and review, on the 3 through 12, we just um, included a little bit about the bring your own technology piece and guidelines during um, assessments. Um, also, there is a tobacco portion on page 19 where we did include e-cigarettes and other uh, tobacco paraphernalia. And then 26 through 29 is mandated information from the state regarding what needs to be included when it comes to the terms of bullying and harassment. On the K through 2, there was just on page 15 a word change. But um, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to review, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now. Uh, otherwise, I'll be happy to take any phone calls or emails from you. We, we include that with the tobacco products and we handle it um, because they should not be having that. We're a tobacco free zone and whether it's electronic or not, they're not to have it on property. It would be handled as if you had cigarettes on your person. Okay. Other questions? And this also includes other tobacco products such as uh, chewing tobacco, snuff, and stuff like that. Yes, sir. And we've also included in there nicotine patches because students are now using that as a way they'll put multiple patches on them and then share them with their friends. So we also had to include that. to the uh, consent agenda. There are three items there, three of those are um, to the minutes of the previous minutes uh, meeting, the two of the reports of FAPE, and approval to purchase Lego robotics equipment. Uh, are there any, uh, uh, any of those items that anyone wishes to call out uh, specifically for the discussion? Now to uh, uh, item six, uh, action agenda. These are uh, items that will require uh, uh, votes. First one being approval of additional appropriations. Uh, Mr. Couch, you want to discuss that with us? Uh, yes, as you were, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ball, to the board, the uh, dual enrollment uh, policy actually can be changed from last year and now that students take dual enrollment courses for free. And I know 
charge. Uh, again, Patrick Henry re re reimburses us for, uh, for that cost based on because it's our faculty, their faculty. And so this money comes in and then the, the reimbursement. So it's an additional appropriation uh, for us. We have to add that to our budget. So that's in the amount of $429,000. Some schools have two, some schools have one, but in any given year, you could have X number, you could have in school, you have, you only have 16 kids in a class, but you may have 40 applications or 40 kids that qualify. And another school that may have two may only have 17 or 18, so there's 
that case, you'd move that class to that particular school. We've had to do that on a number of occasions uh, to try to make the, uh, the, the numbers match in terms of uh, where, the, where the students are. Okay. We usually end up with close to 50% of the, right at, right at around 48 to 50% of the students who would be incoming kindergarten in the following year are in our district right now. Okay. I think I know the answer, but I'd just like to hear it. What's the major factor as to why we cannot offer more? Well, there are two factors. One, funding, and the second would be facility space. Yeah, if every, I just want you to say it. <laughs> if every, every four-year-old came to us, we, we could not have Um, I'm here this morning um, again every year I, I come before the board to get your uh, approval and appropriation of our special education uh, annual plan um, our annual plan this year um, it consists of two parts our 6b flow through amount and then our preschool 619 fund just a little bit about the annual plan um, this year our preliminary award which we're told every year about this time to develop a budget based on some preliminary amounts and then our final award will be um, sent to divisions around July August and then we make adjustments or amendments as, as necessary but our preliminary amount is one million nine hundred ninety one thousand twenty seven dollars and um, that amount is a decrease from last year of one hundred and fifty one thousand six hundred and sixty three um, we, do, we are required by federal regulations to set aside a proportionate amount of our funding, and this year it's $41,106, and that set aside money is designed to be spent on parentally placed private school students for uh, speech services. That was the um, special ed um, service that we designated, which is very similar to other school divisions. So we are required out of that money to set that money aside to provide those speech services. Um, and, and it rolls over every year. Our funding is 100% reimbursable. And we do allocate the money uh, to support our strategic plan and strategy one and two. First of all, uh, we use the money to provide high quality instruction and high quality professionals. We pay 23 highly qualified teachers out of the money and 13 highly qualified paraprofessionals. And we also uh, provide the summer bus driver salaries and benefits. Other things that come out of that uh, million, 1.9 million is our extended school year program, medical examinations uh, that may be required. We partner with Piedmont Community Services and provide behavior specialist services to some of our students. It also pays for our computerized IEP management system, which used to be I Easy IEP, is now Ed Plan. And uh, we also send some students to Mark Workshop. And then 
pay for orientation and mobility services for our blind and vision impaired students. Additionally, child find activities, which we conduct throughout the year, making sure that we make it known to the community that for parents or agencies who feel like they have students that may need evaluations or support through special education, that we make sure they know how to get in touch with us. Parental involvement activities, speech services, again, for those parentally placed privates with students. We use some of the money to purchase teacher materials and supplies, assistive technology equipment, and iPads and laptops as those become antiquated or obsolete or are needed in some of the programs. Additionally, we want to support and make our students college and career ready, so we support a lot of the initiatives that we are doing in Henry County in our schools. The co-teaching initiative that we started at the middle school, we continue to support. The iPad initiative, Read 180 and System 44, because reading is very important, and we certainly recognize that special education students have reading weaknesses, and we need to make sure that we're supporting those areas. And we also do some community-based curriculum with a certain population of our students. The additional part of the annual plan is our preschool award. That's considered Project 619, and that amount, preliminary amount, is $79,919. That is also reduced from last year, but it, again, is 100% reimbursable. Some things that are paid out of the preschool grant, we pay for an ECSE teacher in special education. That's early childhood special ed, which is essentially preschool. We have more than one teacher in preschool, but we pay for one of their salaries out of the 619 funds. We also pay for summer program services, preschool conferences and workshop training for our teachers, educational supplies and materials, student enrichment experiences, which we try to partner with Virginia Preschool Initiative so that our students are with non-disabled peers as much as possible when we do some activities. Child find activities, parental involvement, equipment, computers, and furniture that we may need for the program. And that's essentially how the money is allocated in our programs. Are there any questions about that? Questions from the board? Sometimes I know that there are residential students that we can't provide a program for here at the Baysides or residential locations somewhere. Does the money for that come from here, or where does that come from? We work with CPMP and CSA funds when we have to place students. We have to determine that we cannot educate them, and then we work with that agency to place them and pay for their... What is the maximum age that a parent can choose to send these three special kids to Henry County? Is it 23? 22. It's 22. Yeah, it goes through 21, but some of our students turn 22 within that school year. And this is a federal mandate, the 22? A lot of people don't know that, and I have tried. I forget that myself. They can choose to send them to 22 years old. Well, through age 21, but some of them actually age to 22 if they turn 21, I mean, before September. Other questions? If not, we'll entertain a motion for approval of this application. Second. Second. Is there a question on this? If not, those in favor of this motion signify by raising your right hand. Okay, Ms. Rose, I believe you have the next item also, approval of the special needs three times or three years. Yes, sir, I do. Also, as part of the annual plan, federal regulations require that we have a special education parent advisory committee, and this committee meets quarterly, and it is comprised of special education parents and also could be students with disabilities. The meetings are open to the public, and I'm just asking the members of that committee today. Thank you. There is an attachment. Thank you. 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 Thank
question, I think, of, of, of the members. from Blue Cross and Blue Shield has provided renewal information to us for the 2014-15 school year. Attached to your four packet was the premium renewal sheet for Anthem for self-insured. We are looking at going to self-insured, hoping that down the road it will save us money. We are proposing to do the fully insured premium rate, which is an increase of 8%, and it's only $4.62 from the maximum aggregate stop loss level for the self-insured. We are asking, um, once again, the retirees we pay 100% of the single subscriber premium for the retirees to stay on our insurance, and they pay 100% of their end premium. It's recommended that the coverage be continued with Anthem for the period of July 1st through June 30th, 2015, and the school system continue paying 100% of the single subscriber premium for active employees contingent upon approval of memorandum of understanding with the county. Uh, Dr. Cotton has mentioned in a previous meeting, we are working with the county to come up with a, a memorandum of understanding about the funding because the, until we collect the premiums from our staff to pay the bills as they come in, we may need to work with the county on them funding the monies to us until we collect them and get to the point that we're still on the funding, excuse me. Uh, also, we're looking at um, the profit sharing. If there's a year that we have money left, how do we share it between the two groups? Okay, this is a uh, new adventure for uh, Henry County Schools. <coughs> we'll be partnering, partnering with the uh, county administration uh, as part of the new plan. Yes, the, the county employees are right on our insurance policy. Are there, uh, questions about this? I that this, uh, you're asking that we feed this contingent on a memorandum of approval. Yes, sir. Which has not yet been generated. No, sir. What other localities have this similar type of arrangement? Uh, as far as self-funded, with the ones I've talked to, um, the main one that I know of is Renner County. They have been self-insured since the early 90s. I believe it, um, it was 1998 when they said they became self-insured. I did also talk to Bedford. They became self-insured, I think it was two years ago, and, and switched to self-insured. Now, I think Bedford is not with Anthem. They're with another group. And that's working out for those two localities? Corona County, yes. Yeah. So do you use a broker or a consultant? We do. Uh, it's BB and T Consulting Group. Elizabeth Maiden is our broker. How, how were they chosen? Why were they chosen? Did we submit an RFP for um, a broker to work with Anthem, or why did you choose BB? They have been our broker since before I came to work here. Do we know their annual fees or their commission? Um, their annual fee to us. The broker fee is about, I think it's seven thousand and seventy-two hundred dollars. And they pay the same fee to get their self-insured plan. Did you, did you know how that compares to other brokers? Or I, I guess what I'm getting at is, if y'all were making this transition, it seemed that there would be the potential for um, some reduction in fees if we take advantage. While we make this transition, is that something we've considered? Yeah, we are actually looking at because there are going to be some other requirements that you know our our insurance companies were doing, such as HIPAA compliance, 
Uh, we also have a tax return by going self-insured that we now have to submit to the IRS. And we've been discussing that that's possibly something we may do by hiring an outside person to help us with that. So it is possible. I don't know if our insurance broker fees will, will be reduced by going this method. Um, that's not something we've discussed that I can find out for you. But I'm just, I guess I'm asking, have we considered other brokers? Or are we just planning to stick with BB&T just to get rid of the Okay, so far we're pleased with what BB&T has done for us. And we've had several different brokers within the BB&T group as they've come in and left or retired. Yes, sir. I'm not talking to um, Roanoke County, their person in charge of finance there. It's something we really should bring to the board, and we will need your approval on that, final approval. So we would have an opportunity to kind of peruse that document and determine if, uh, if we're all satisfied with it. Yes, sir. The, the, the balance between school system, which is the overwhelming majority of these calls, is it to be hundreds? Yes, sir. That's that's what we're asking for. Okay. I can deal with that. I know that uh, I've tried to have a lot of conversations with people in Roanoke, and I guess they seem very, very pleased with what we've done. They are too. And he, I think they, he just quoted a figure that we would have saved this year had we been under this type of plan. It's potentially, as our broker told us, you know, as soon as she says that we're going to save money the first year, then we're going to have a really bad year, and we're not going to save money. We're going to end up in the hole, right. which is part of the discussions with the county. Yeah. You know, how, how are we going to do that? Who covers that? If we, you know, because we don't have carry bonds, funds, and, but that will all be addressed in this memorandum. That's where. So for the employees, that will be a seamless transition from, from fully insured to self-insured. Okay, you, you think we will see this memorandum by June? Uh, I'm, I'm not involved in it, but I, would, I think it has to be done by June. Right, so it's, it's good if it's June, but yeah. Okay, then we move to uh, item F, uh, approval of property casual and workers' compensation insurance for FY 2015. And doing our renewal for um, property and casualty and workers' compensation, I also work with an outside insurance consultant, Sam Rosenthal of Rosenthal Insurance Consulting, and he recommends approving continued coverage with Baco Risk Management. For 2014, the workers' property premiums were $327,527, and the proposed premiums for FY 2015 is $418,310, which is an increase of $90,783. The workers' compensation premiums for this year are $148,460. And for 2015, the proposed premium is $223,671, which is an increase of $75,211. And also for the workers' compensation, 
our experience rating has gone up slightly, and we also had the increase in January of the 2% raise, which also affects that, the salaries that this is based on. It's recommended that the property casualty and workers' compensation insurance coverages be continued with base code risk management for 2015. Questions regarding this uh, application process? If not, uh, I entertain a motion to approve this uh, request. Fair, a lesson in the game of life. <coughs> First graders in Miss Davis and Miss Hatches in Miss Ramsey's class at Sandytown Elementary recently put their learning to work by hosting an economics fair. The students work for three weeks to earn play money and spend in the fair to buy financial services from their classmates. Each student was required to choose a business, either selling goods or doing a service, and the parents helped them create signs, procure the goods to be sold, set prices, and then send in all supplies. Children learn that good, that, that good choices equal more goods and services for your money, and good work habits meant more money in your pocket to spend or save, a lesson that will serve them well in years to come. On a roll of dice-driven data, fifth graders at John Ray Smith worked in, co in cooperative learning groups to construct STEM and LEAP plots. Data was obtained using a pair of dice that students rolled to get their numbers. After STEM and LEAP plots were constructed, students were asked to calculate the mean median, the mode, and the range. Plant days. Kindergarten and first grade students from Axon Elementary School visited the greenhouse at Magna Vista High School to learn about plants and animals. Students learned about the importance of bees, sampled honey, fed chicks, observed goats, and planted and examined seeds. All of the content was taught by horticulture and agriculture students from Magna Vista. Created Mr. Roboto. At FC Middle School, Mr. Grandinetti wanted his students to explore the idea of robots, their purpose, and their purpose, possible future, and how far robotics has come. The students <coughs> do the research and construct a paper based on their findings. However, some students chose to build what they learned out of things easily accessible to them, using juice boxes, Pringle, can Pringle cans, cardboard, paint, and whatever odds and ends they could find. These seven students created robot replicas. Sixth grade, sixth grade Jacob Harris said it was very fun and exciting. Each student posed proudly with his or her robot creation. STEM, SUMU, and mini golf robotics team winners. Law Park Middle School seventh grade robotics team won first and second place in the STEM fair this year. Twelve robotics teams from Law Park and FC Middle School participated in two separate challenges. One was a robot mini golf challenge, and the other was a robot SUMU wrestling challenge. The overall winning team in first place in the robot mini golf challenge was Team Alpha, Holden Agee and Austin Hurd. The overall second place team in first place in the robot sumo wrestling challenge was Team Terminators, Hunter Chitwood and Colton Johnson. Environment cooperation, environment cooperation among schools and community. Joel Bunn's biology and environmental science classes from Magna Vista rooted black willow cuttings as part of the, stream, the streamside trees in the classroom project. Students from biology classes met up with students from Collinsville Primary School at the Bowens Creek in early April and partnered to help plant the cuttings and participate in lessons presented by Mr. Bunn. The Dan River Basin Association and the Army Corps of Engineers, 78 cuttings were successfully grown and planted along an eroding steep stream bank to help reduce erosion and stabilize the bank. The students from both schools learned a lot from the project about streamside science and environmental stewardship. Stanley Town Elementary Engineers at Work with Legos. Did you know that scientists now have enough DNA to clone a woolly mammoth? Stanley Town Elementary fifth graders recently hosted Stephen Schumacher, a representative from Builds Express Lego program, and put
put a new spin on an old idea. How would you build a real Jurassic Park? Students were asked by their math and science teacher, Rebecca Floyd, to construct a paddock with storage buildings and work rooms. They were also told to calculate the number of dinosaurs that could live there based on the dinosaurs' living space requirements. This project-based learning activity requires students to read a scientific article discussing the future of cloning and extinct species. Extinct species. Research dinosaurs, dinosaur facts for needed requirements for their living environment and calculate the park's needed size using perimeter and area. The project just may inspire today's students to become future engineers that will build the real Jurassic Park. Not all of its multiplication football challenge. In order to gain more mastery of the basic multiplication facts, Mount Olive Elementary issued an SOL football challenge to its third, fourth, and fifth graders. Learning these basic facts is crucial for them to be successful with more difficult mathematical problems. Classes were asked to master all facts from 0 to 12. Growth was charted using daily and weekly drills. As they progressed, their, their, their team football was moved down the field. The class who got to the goal line first was the winner. This program was fifth grade class, Texas Tech Red Raiders. They will be awarded a tailgate party in their honor. Whole Kids Foundation Grant. Action Elementary School was awarded a $2,000 grant from the Whole Kids Foundation through Whole Foods. The money will be used to improve the drainage of the garden, adding a composter and additional tools for the garden. Three cheers for 25 years. Happy birthday, happy 25th birthday to Magna Vista. English 9 and uh, pre AP students have combined research, media, writing, and oral presentation strategies to produce a video honoring the 25 years. 25 years of students who have passed through Magna Vista. Students in Melanie Mark Grace classes have interviewed graduates of Magna Vista beginning in 1998 when the school opened. They are currently working with Daniel Rodriguez and Liz Russell to edit the show for presentation to the faculty and staff during Teacher Appreciation Week. The faculty will be served birthday cake during their playing blocks by watching the video. Samuel's after school choir performs. Samuel Elementary 3rd, 4th, and 5th graders after school choir members have shown the dedication, commitment, and responsibility in their performances. Ms. Hobbs always tries to choose songs with the message that the students and parents can relate to and appreciate. Warrior Tech Community Interaction. The Classical Connections class at Magnus High School's Warrior Tech Academy held a roundtable discussion which focused on parallel themes between the cultures of the European Middle Ages and the Great Depression in the United States. The novel To Kill a Mockingbird served as an impetus for the students' understanding of America during the 1930s. The students conversed in small groups of 20 adult community leaders to share their research and opinions. Jump rope for a cause at Campbell Court Elementary. Jump rope part is a big deal at Campbell Court. Students raised $4,141.41 for the American Heart Association. The student who raised the most money in each grade level got a special treat. Also, if any student turned in money for the Jump Rope Heart Foundation, fundraiser, they got to throw a water balloon at Mr. Sy. Throughout the fundraiser, all students learned about the benefits of exercise and how to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Mr. Sy, physical education teacher, jump room, a heart coordinator, organized this fundraiser for Campbell Court. Druid Mason students collect over 2,000 items for SPCA. Students at Druid Mason participated in a supply drive to benefit the SPCA. The class would compete to see which class could collect the most items. Students earned, a du earned double points for items brought during the school's April PTA meet. Over 2,000 items were collected to donate to the SBCA. Red Cross Club at, at Axon Elementary. Axon Elementary recently began the first ever Red Cross Club in our region. Irby, the miniature response, emergency response vehicle, visited the school to spark students' interest in community service. Service projects will include passing out snacks and orange juice during blood donation drives and collecting items to send out in times of need for disasters such as tissue, soap, and wipes. Family Fitness Night. At Collinsville Primary, they like to get, them, get everyone involved and moving in a healthy way. The physical education teacher, Ms. Moyer, held several Family Fitness Night events for the students and their parents to come out and have some fun exercising and playing games. The Collinsville YMCA donated healthy snacks for the events. ELL Mariachi Night. Takers Elementary School recently held ELL Mariachi Night. Students, parents, and other guests were able to dine on a small meal while enjoying the sound of the mariachi band. Students were also given an opportunity to try and break the pinata. In this picture, a fifth grade student, Jose Alvarado Ang Angles, has his turn at the pinata. Carver Elementary Walkathon for, re for Relay for Life. Carver Elementary.
73 students participated in the annual Carver Walkathon on April 11th. The 73 students who participated raised $3,349.64 for the American Cancer Society's Relay for Life. The top money raisers for this event were Autumn Wingfield and Cooper Smith. Magna Vista High, High School National Honor Society and Ridgeway Public Library presented a spring extravaganza. Students representing the National Honor Society for Magna Vista partnered for the second consecutive year with the Ridgeway Public Library to present a spring extravaganza. The event was free and open to all individuals. National Honor Society members made crafts for the children, including clucky chickens, bunny fingerprints, and bunny nose. This event is a fantastic demonstration of leadership as members plan and coordinate the event and service as NHS members give back to the community and work with others. Dan River Autism Awareness 5K. Henry County Schools was well represented in the third annual Dan River Autism Awareness 5K. Students, faculty, and aides and school board member Dr. Mary Stanbaugh ran a walk to raise autism awareness. Over $45,000 was raised during the event. Team Awesome Andrew, inspired by Carver student Andrew Divers, raised over $4,500 for autism awareness education. Henry County stu students Lake Eames from Law Park Middle School and Connor Kinkman from Field Oak Collinsville Middle School were overall winners of the 5K race. Lake Eames finished first and Connor Kinkman finished third. Congratulations, Bassett High School National Honor Society induction. 54 students from Bassett High School were inducted as new members of the National Honor Society. We're very proud to recognize these outstanding members of our student body. National Honor Society members are chosen for and then expected to continue their exemplary con contribution to the school and community. So Amy Jarrett, Chapter Advisor. New Tech Teacher Earned Certification. At Magna Vista High School, Brooke Hankins has achieved New Tech Network Certified Teacher status for demonstrating a deep understanding of the key components of the New Tech model, including project-based learning, teaching and assessing 21st century skills, technology use in the classroom, and the unique culture that empowers students. This certification allows Ms. Hankins to instruct not only high school students in Warrior Tech, but also trained personnel. Students to participate in Honors Choir. Two students from Henry County Public Schools were selected to attend the American Coal Director's Southern Division Honors Choir in Jacksonville, Florida in March. Caitlin Kidd, an eighth grade student from Law Park Middle School, auditioned for the Junior Honors Choir and Joni Crawford, a junior from Magna Vista High School, auditioned for the Senior Honors Choir. The students auditioned with over 2,000 other students in, the, in their particular local range from the 13 states that make up the Southern Division. Mary Ann Heath is the Choir Director for Law Park and Anita Ray for Magna Vista. Law Park Middle School FFA selected top 10% in Virginia. The Virginia FFA Association has selected Law Park Middle School FFA as one of the top 10% chapters in Virginia for 2013-14. Only 17 FFA, FFA chapters out of the Virginia's 170 were selected. This year, Law Park Middle School FFA has the distinct honor of being one of those five middle school chapters selected. <coughs> the chapters are selected because they have the most outstanding programs in student, chapter, and community development. The state winner will be announced this summer at the state convention at Virginia Tech. Advisors for the Law Park chapter are Donna Kazor and Champ Hardy. Law Park Middle School FFA public speaking winners. Sullivan Higgins and Lake Eames recently represented Law Park Middle School in the 17 county Southside area FFA junior prepared and creed speaking contest at the agricultural complex in Chatham. Lake placed first in the junior prepared uh, public speaking contest. Lake's eight minute prepared speech was presented to a panel of judges and countered with questions for about his topic, organic products. Sullivan recited the FFA creed and answered direct, answered direct questions from the judges. Sullivan placed second overall in the contest. Chapter advisors were Donna Kazor and Champ Hardy, agri-science teachers at Law Park Middle School. Floyd receives award of excellence. Magna Vista High School teacher Lloyd Floyd received the Dominion Award of Excellence established by the Virginia Association for Education and Rehabilitation of Blind and Visually Impaired, which honors a member and recognizes achievement in the field of work for the blind and visually impaired. Among the criteria for the award, a person should demonstrate extensive collaboration with other disciplines or organizations working with people who are visually impaired in order to enhance the overall quality of life of the individuals who are visually impaired. Best of the rate, best of the best raters. Magna Vista uh, 
JROTC Raider team are the honor to attend the best of the best Raider challenge for the 4th Brigade, Brigade Central East Coast at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. This event matches the top teams from each state ranging from Maryland to South Carolina. There are approximately 424 schools within this range. Only 5% are invited. In order to be invited, a team must have finished in the top three in one of the qualifying meets throughout the year. In the five meets, Magnum Vista attended, they won three of them. Central Office and Teacher Technology Awards. Several awards were recently given at the SBRTC Awards Magnum at Longwood College. Winners from Henry County Public Schools were Technology Support Award, Rob Wagner. This award recognizes a technology support person that advanced the school division's technology environment through providing crucial technical support. Instructional Support Award, Mona Rawlins. This award recognizes an instructional support person that advanced the school division's technology environment through providing crucial instructional technology support. Technology Teacher Award, Drew Lowry. This award recognizes a classroom teacher who advances learning through integration of technology into the curriculum. First today, we tried to fix this so it would be easier for you to see from up there. Um, our revised budget is $74,789,990. And looking at our year to date expenditures, plus we have what we have encumbered in open POs, our total expenditures we project to be as of the end of March $51,772,334.32, which leaves us available about $23 million. We have to remember we still have payroll for April, May, and June, and also our teachers are paid during the month of July, which goes back into it. We are looking that our enrollment is down. I believe our original budget was 7,064 students, and as of March 30th, our enrollment uh, 6,987 students. So we are going to be below what we budgeted for in revenue. We're watching that very closely so that we don't go over that amount of money that we have projected so far with what we've gotten from the state. Are there any questions? And the appropriation that you did today for the um, tuition paid in state, that will increase our revised budget, but we have already expended the money. Part of the expenditures for dual enrollment for Magna Vista were posted in April, and the exact that will be posted in May. generally have scheduled a retreat at some point uh, during the uh, summer. I don't know if there's anything in uh, uh, that one on that at this time or not. I'm ready to make that assessment. Well, we will do that. Other issues? I have a list of uh, meetings and events and also conferences that are uh, coming up shortly. Session under Section 2.2-3. 
Thank you. 